In this lecture, we're going to be talking about isoimmunization. Isoimmunization can lead to hydrops vitalis, erythroblastalis vitalis, all names that mean fetal anemia. Basically, mom develops antibodies that attacks baby's blood, leading to fetal anemia. While we're going to talk solely about isoimmunization, you should also recognize that other causes of fetal anemia exist, and you can use the same process for diagnosis. We're going to go over the pathogenesis of isoimmunization. So this is all about immune disease. And it's all about mom. So what has to happen is that mom has to be Rh negative. That is her blood has no Rh antigen. And then when baby comes along, who is Rh positive, mom sees that blood as foreign and she develops an antibody to this antigen. On first exposure, that is the first time the body encounters an antigen, which is true in this case as well, the initial response, the primary exposure, is IgM. And IgM is a huge molecule, and it cannot cross the placenta. IgM forms a pentamer, so it is too large to get through. The secondary exposure, when mom is already primed against the Rh positive antigen, will be IgG. IgG is smaller and can cross the placenta. So recognize that on first exposure, that is mom's first Rh positive baby, that baby is going to do fine. But that baby is going to prime mom to attack future Rh positive babies. That's the idea. So how does mom get exposed? How does mom even know that that Rh antigen is there? Because she won't see baby's blood unless baby's blood gets into her circulation. So an Rh negative mom with an Rh positive dad has the potential for an Rh positive baby. That is, the fetus has Rh positive. Baby's cells have to get into mom, which means that in addition to this combination, you need some sort of hemorrhage, some sort of maternal fetal mixing. Or, this doesn't really happen anymore since we screen blood, mom could have received an Rh positive transfusion. Which, because it's not an ABO mismatch, may not have caused a serious reaction in mom, but it may have primed her against future Rh positive babies. But just having antibodies isn't enough. And this is something you're not going to get tested on a lot, but it is true. So if you want to go for that 290, take this information away from you. The antibodies are of different subtypes. Lewis antibodies lives. That is, they do not kill baby. Duffy dies. Duffy subtype antibodies do kill baby. And Cal subtype kills, which means does kill baby. And in order for even Duffy or Cal to do some damage, they have to be in sufficient titer to cause some serious trouble. So titers that are greater than one to eight are sufficient to induce anemia in a fetus. And remember, when you do titers, the bigger the second number, the more antibodies there are. This is not a ratio. The bigger the second number, the more antibodies there are. So one to eight, one to 32, one to 64, all of those are gonna cause problems for baby. So recognize that for this to even be an issue, you have to have an Rh negative mom, you have to have a dad who's Rh positive or at least unknown to suspect it, which means there's a potential for baby to be Rh positive. Then you also have to have the certain type of, certain subtype of antibodies in sufficient quantity 
to cause problems for baby. The bottom line is that this doesn't happen very often. So if you have that rare combination of an RH negative mom with an RH positive dad who could have had an RH positive baby, who has already had an RH positive baby previously, who has the right subtypes and an adequate titer, you first have to ask, is this baby even at risk? So you've got the potential. First thing you're going to do is get those RH antibody and titers. Because if these antibodies aren't there, there is no risk. And you can simply stop the workup. But if those antibodies are there, the next question you ask is, is baby anemic? And there's a number of ways you can do this, and we're going to talk about them all after I get through the graph here. But the way you usually, the diagnostic modality of choice is a transcranial Doppler. If you remember from our advanced early testing lecture, the transcranial Doppler is an ultrasound. It's non-invasive and is very sensitive for fetal anemia. Whereas the other procedures, the amniocentesis and the pubs are invasive and will cause some risk of fetal loss. So the transcranial Doppler is the best test of choice to assess if baby is anemic. If baby's not anemic, you can stop. Even if mom had all the titers and the right subtypes. But if the transcranial Doppler shows the baby is anemic, the question you have to ask is, can we deliver? Because fetal anemia can kill baby. The treatment for fetal anemia can kill baby. So you make the decision based on gestational age. Will baby benefit from more time in the oven? And that is if the gestational age is greater than 34 weeks, a little prematurity is worth the risk of transfusion. So if it's greater than 34 weeks, you simply deliver. If there's less than 30, 34 weeks, you're going to transfuse. How do you transfuse? Let's talk about first the other modalities of assessing anemia and then get to how you do the transfusion. In order to diagnose fetal anemia, the diagnostic modality of choice is the transcranial Doppler. Non-invasive, very sensitive. You can do amniocentesis. And what you'll do is you'll plot bilirubin and albumin on a graph. And if they're Lily graph 3, then they're considered anemic. But you're not going to do amniocentesis. Because amniocentesis carries a risk of fetal loss. It's not that specific. And it does not provide you any access for transfusion. The transcranial Doppler doesn't give you access for transfusion but it tells you whether or not the baby's anemic. In order to confirm the anemia, you do the percutaneous umbilical vein blood sampling, the pubs, because what it will give you is direct access to baby's blood. And you'll know exactly what the hematocrit is. If the hematocrit is less than 35%, the baby is anemic. And it also gives you access to transfusion. you put a needle into the umbilical vein. It's very difficult to do and has a very high rate of fetal loss, but if you get that line, you're able to then transfuse baby. This is what we do when we suspect someone is anemic as a result of isoimmunization. Wouldn't it be better if we could simply prevent isoimmunization from ever happening? So what we do is try to prophylax against it. And what this means is, what are the instances and when do we give Rogam. Now remember, you have to have some sort of maternal fetal mixing 
in the instances where this can happen, or in any abortive procedure, like a dilation and curettage, during a normal delivery, especially if there's postpartum hemorrhage, and especially in any third trimester bleeding. Anytime mom and baby's blood can mix. And you can also consider this in ectopic pregnancies or in, even in gestational trophoblastic disease. If baby is Rh positive and mom is Rh negative, you need to prevent mom from ever developing those antibodies. So if you have an Rh negative mom, you give Rogam at 28 weeks. And within 72 hours of any delivery or procedure. How this works is that Rogam is an antibody against Rh positive antigen, but it's FC receptor mom can't recognize. So essentially, Rogam hides Rh positive antibody from Rh negative mom. If mom's immune system never sees the antigen, she never develops an immune response against it. And so what, we're, what we talked about during this lecture was isoimmunization. And really what you have to be able to do is decide, is baby at risk? That is, is there the right maternal paternal pairing? Is baby likely to be Rh positive? And are there enough titers to cause fetal anemia? If there are, you need to assess for fetal anemia using either the transcranial Doppler or amniocentesis or pubs. Generally, repeat transcranial Doppler is the way to go. And if you need to transfuse, then use the pubs because it's a dangerous procedure but gives you access to transfusion. And of course, the big question is, when do you give Rogam? And if you take away any time mom was pregnant and is not pregnant anymore, Rogam's a probably good idea, so long as mom was Rh negative. That's isoimmunization. We make these videos for free, and we need your help. Please donate, because without your donations, we can't make any more videos. Please donate.